Please be seated. You may continue. Judge, I believe where we left off, we were going to publish states 192. And Officer Smith, as that is playing, is that a, a picture from inside the Sally Port area at the police station? Yes, it is. <clears throat> is that your patrol car pulling in? Yes, it is. Is that you that just got out of the driver's seat? Yes, sir. And is that a, was that an accurate depiction of your interaction with the defendant as he got out of the patrol car and, and walked into the station? Yes, it was. All right. Is that just you and the defendant walking through one of the interior doors? Yes, sir. And again, is that just you and the defendant walking through another portion of the police station? Yes, sir. All right. You know, that's all we need for the lights. Thank you. All right. Did you take the defendant to an interview room? Yes, sir. And was anyone in the interview room when you placed the defendant in there? No, sir. Did you uncuff the defendant uh, when you placed him in the interview room? Yes, I did. Did you offer him something to drink? I did. Did you stay in that room with the defendant? No, sir. Where did you go? Uh, the room's monitored by one-way glass, so I went around to the other side of the glass. All right, and were you able to see the defendant um, from the other side of the glass? Yes, sir. Did you watch the defendant until someone arrived uh, yes, to sir. speak with him? Yes, sir. And about how long was that? Uh, 30, to, 30 to 40 minutes. All right. At any time while you were watching the defendant uh, for 30 to 40 minutes through the one-way glass, did he lose consciousness? No, sir. Did he appear to have any physical problems of any kind, falling out of the chair, anything like that? No, sir. Did he do anything that caused you concern about his health during that 30 to 40 minute period? No, sir. And who was it who arrived to interview the defendant? I believe it was Investigator Singleton. Did you participate in that interview? No, sir, I did not. And where were you when um, Detective Singleton was speaking with the defendant? Um, back on the other side of the one-way glass. All right. Could you hear what they were saying? Not enough. You can hear people talking, but it's not enough to make out. You can't make out what they're saying? Correct. All right. Thank you, sir. Judge, that's all I have. Thank you, Cross. Yes, I'm not here. Uh, 
Afternoon, officer. How are you doing? Good. How are you, sir? Thanks for being here today. How long have you been an officer? Since 2005. Okay. And what was your training? What did you do to become an officer? I attended the Law Enforcement Academy. Okay. How long a course is that? That's just shy of 700 hours. In addition, have you taken any um, other courses like in um, community college or anything uh, along the way or even before? I have attended uh, Seminole State College, yes. That's just down the street? Yes, sir. Um, what type of courses did you take? Uh, it's general education courses. Okay. Any focus on um, criminal justice, your chosen career? Not at Seminole State, no, sir. Okay. How long did you want to be a cop before you became one? Since I was little. Okay. Sort of a life goal for you then? Yes, sir. Why is that? I enjoy helping and educating. Okay. The uh, traditional one, I guess it's not in all police cars, but it's on a lot of them, protect and serve. Yes, sir. Is that sort of a, a goal of yours then as a police officer? Yes, sir. Feel that's a pretty noble goal? Yes, sir. Do you enjoy it? Yes, sir. Can't enjoy it quite as much when you get a shots fired call, though, can you? It's going to be a little concerning, right? Yes, sir. Um, so you go on the radio, I think you testified about the map, and you get a call about a disturbance first, is that correct? Suspicious person. That's right. Um, at some point it got upgraded, did it not? Yes, sir, it did. To shots fired? Yes, sir. Um, what is what do you then do once you have a shots fired um, event? Uh, you tend to wait for a little bit more additional information, but it becomes more of an officer safety issue. At that point, you're off officer safety, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so you came in, did the circle, and actually, almost coincidentally, I guess, you were able to shine a light down that entire sort of alleyway um, towards where this event actually occurred, right? Yes, sir. Um, and noticed at least one person towards the end? Yes, sir. Could you even tell who it was at that point? No, sir. So you pull up your car and then get out and you take out, um, how do you equip yourself as you're going out of your car to go to that back alleyway? Uh, due to the lighting, I grabbed a flashlight. Okay. I talked to another officer before you and he said that his um, gun actually has a flashlight on it. Was that the way yours was set up or? Yes, my gun does have a flashlight on it. Was that what you used? I uh, know. No, sir. I used an actual okay. standard flashlight. Um, so when you first came around that corner heading over towards the scene, that, did you know that was the scene where the shooting occurred? No, sir. I did not. Okay. So when you first came up on the scene, you had your flashlight out? Yes, sir. Had you taken out your service revolver yet? Not at that point, no, sir. Okay. Um, tell me what you first see when you come on scene. I saw Mr. Zimmerman stand on the sidewalk. There may have been somebody out there with him, and I saw Trayvon land in the grass. Okay. And when you say sidewalk, there was a walkway that you sort of came down from your car, correct? Correct. The sidewalk makes a T. And there's a T intersection. Right. Um, as you came around that corner, you, can you sort of orient us to where near the T or how far down that T Mr. Zimmerman was? Uh, if you came around the side of the building to the top of the T, it was approximately 30 feet. 30 feet from the T Once, intersection? Correct. Okay. Very close by to where Trayvon Martin's body was, right? Yes, sir. Within feet? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, what was he doing? Who? Mr. Zimmerman. He was standing on the sidewalk. Okay. Uh, did he look towards you as you were coming towards him? Yes. Do you remember at that point whether or not there was anybody else present? There may have been, but I'm not 100% certain. Okay. And um, flashlight on Mr. Zimmerman at that point? Yes, sir. And could you tell he was wearing the clothes that we've talked about, the orange or red jacket? Yes, sir. At that point, could you see the injuries to his nose when you first had, when you first had the flashlight on him? Yes, sir. Okay. And were they similar uh, as to the picture that we've seen a little while ago? Yes, sir. Okay. Even more with the actual bleeding at that point, wasn't it? That's correct. Okay. And his eyes were watered? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Um, both eyes, correct? Yes, sir. And um, what did you first say to him? I asked him if he had seen what happened. And his response? Yes. Did that seem like an appropriate response? Anything wrong with the way he answered you? No, sir. Next, would you ask him? Uh, if he had seen, if the young man had been shot, and if he had seen who shot him. And how did he respond? Uh, that he did, that he did, and that he was still armed. Okay. Um, at that point, what's your response to find out that somebody involved in a shooting is right there in front of you, armed? Uh, at that point, as when I unholstered my service weapon. And take it out? Correct. That's protocol, is it not? Correct. Again, it's officer safety is your number one right. charge because without that you can't do anything else. Correct. Can't help anyone else. Correct. Okay. Um, point it at him? Yes, sir. And again, that's appropriate, correct? Yes, sir. You did not, you did not point it at him because of any um, immediate threat that he posed to you, correct? He didn't challenge you in any way, did he? No, sir. Matter of fact, he was completely cooperative, was he not? Yes, sir. But protocol is you arm yourself um, and make sure that you have it on him to take care of the situation. Yes, sir. And um, what did you next ask him? Uh, to, as he was telling me that he had shot him and he was still armed, was when he kind of leaned over to expose the firearm. So if I were to do that then for just a moment, tell me, I could have you do it, I'm gonna try, but the gun was on his right hip, I think you testified? Correct. So this jacket is longer than the one he was wearing, right? Yes, sir. But if we flipped it up sort of a silly way, he went like this. Yes, sir. And just by this movement was able to do enough. The hands exposure. going up and the leaning over. Oh, okay, so sort of like that. Right. And in just doing that movement, that was enough of a movement where the gun was exposed, correct? Correct. The jacket didn't cover the gun by more than a couple of a few inches, right? I don't believe so. Okay. So any movement up of the jacket, even that small movement that he did by leaning over, exposed the gun, right? Correct. And had the jacket been ridden up in any form or fashion, the gun would have been exposed, right? I would imagine so, yes. So, um, do you remember if he had a cell phone in his hand or not? I don't recall. Okay. In any case, he showed you his gun, kept mm -hmm. his hands in the air, didn't he? Correct. That's what you told him to do? Yes. Okay. And. What do you do at that point now that you have a flashlight, a gun, and you see another gun? Um, I asked Mr. Zimmerman to put his hands on top of his head, interlock his fingers. Okay. Uh, at which point I reholstered, made contact, hands on contact with Mr. Zimmerman and placed him in handcuffs. Okay. You lead the gun until you get his hands secured? Yes, sir. And that's protocol as well? That's choice. Okay. He didn't uh, resist in any way, did he? No, sir. Um, and I guess that not resisting is you have him like this, interlocked, correct? Correct. Then you would either turn him around or go behind him? To handcuff him? Yeah. I was behind him. Right. Take one arm, get it back, take correct. the other arm. You've of course been in, I would imagine, hundreds of situations having to handcuff people, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and most people, I'll, I'll let you answer it. What percentage of people at least offer some resistance to you when you're trying to get their arms behind their back? I object to the relevance of anyone else. It's Using for, um, have you had other people resist getting their arms behind the back? Same objection, Your Honor, relevance. At this point, I don't want to speak to you. Well, there's response. a please approach. I'll rephrase it. Okay. Let me rephrase it. Did Mr. Zimmerman offer any response whatsoever to your um, cuffing him behind his back. Any response of resistance? Yeah, did he respond, did he resist at all? If I no. said response, I apologize. Did no. he resist at all? No, sir. Complied with that um, command of yours immediately? Yes, sir. And completely? Yes, sir. Once you had him secured, um, then you were able to secure his firearm? Yes, sir. And I think a point was made that at that point, your focus, um, even more so than other people involved, is to secure the firearm, correct? Correct. And though in a perfect world you might have been able to put on gloves, you didn't have the time then, you just grabbed the gun, 
And I think you said you put it between one of your clips and your vest? Yes, sir. Okay. And that was necessitated by the circumstances, wasn't it? That is correct. That was, again, primary goal number one at that point? Yes, sir. Okay. At that point, is your first contact to Mr. Zimmerman, did he seem angry? No, sir. Did he seem frustrated? No, sir. Did he seem spiteful of anything that was going on? No, sir. Any ill will or hatred at all that you saw him exude as you first saw him literally moments after the event? No, sir. Any concern about him at all except for his injuries? No, sir. Even though he had that obvious injury to his nose, had you that, did you see any injuries to the back of his head yet? While I was securing him, yes, I was so able to see that. as you got behind him, you could see the blood dripping down the back of his head? Correct. So even with those injuries, did he seem agitated? No, sir. There has been testimony that he was seemingly calm. Did he come across that way to you? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, having just gone through what he went through, and now that you know having just shot somebody, did his behavior to you just seem strange? No, sir. Just usual? I wouldn't say usual. Okay. Not, well, was it particularly unusual? No, sir. Even for those circumstances? No, sir. You didn't think that he was, didn't come across to you as being cavalier, did he? No, sir. Or just uncaring? No, sir. Fairly appropriate for what you now know he had just gone through? Correct. So, you secure the gun? Yes, sir. Um, and then what's the next thing that you do? I. Uh, had Mr. Zimmerman have a seat in the rear of my patrol car. Okay. Now let's talk about sort of the walk over. My understanding, again from other testimony, is that another officer came on scene fairly quickly behind you. Do you recall that? That's correct. Uh, do you recall who it was? Officer Ayala. Ayala. And um, you had control of Mr. Zimmerman and that became your now task, correct? Correct. And was it true that Officer Ayala took over the situation of dealing with the other person, now known as Mr. Martin. That is correct. Okay. And as you were going, anything else that you would call Mrs. Zimmerman saying to you at the scene before you started walking towards the car? Not before, no sir. Okay. As you were walking towards the car, didn't he utter something to you, sort of voluntarily? Yes, sir. And what did he say? Uh, he stated to me that he was yelling for help and that nobody would come help him. And how long after you first saw him did that happen? Within uh, a minute? It was a few minutes. Okay. As, it, as long as it took to do what we just talked about? Correct. And then because as soon as you had him cuffed, you secured the gun, right? right. Turned him around and walked him towards your car. Correct. The car was 30 yards away? Approximately. And it was during that walk, actually almost immediately upon turning towards, walking towards the car, that he uttered that to you, right? It wasn't very long after, no, sir. Okay. He actually said that to you twice, didn't he? Correct. Second time was after you got to the car? That's correct. Tell me how he, how he said that. Was it as, uh, tell me how he said that. Uh, it was almost a confusion. So I, I kept, well, tell me. That's, that's basically what it was, sort of, a, sort of a confused confused look on his face. Like he didn't know why, after screaming for help, nobody would come help him? Correct. Object that is called for speculation. I'll rephrase it, Your Honor. Thank you. It came across to you as though he was confused? That's correct. Um, you had testified a little while ago about Mr. Zimmerman's condition. We've talked about his injuries, correct? Yes, sir. And then you also said that the back, particularly the back of his jacket, was wet? Yes, sir. Um, 
of course it was raining on and off that that evening wasn't it yes sir was the back noticeably more wet than the rest of his body yes sir um as though he had been laying in grass on his back that's correct and he actually also had pieces of grass on his back as well correct yes sir could you tell with blue jeans that the back of his blue jeans were wet as well or could it you? appeared to be a little bit darker. A little bit darker than the front? Correct. Eviden evidencing to you what in the darkness? That he had been laying on his back. And that his jeans were wet as well on the back? Correct. Okay. So you get him to the car, which... Um, my understanding is that you stayed with him the entire time? I did. Again, that's your charge at that point, correct? Correct. So you were there when the medical personnel came and um, treated him? I was. Okay. Did, um, did he say anything, well, did he say anything about the facts of the case to the medical personnel? No, sir. When you first arrested him, I'm sorry, when you first detained him, did he ask for a lawyer? No, sir. As far as you know, all the time that you were with him, did he ever ask for a lawyer? No, sir. So you have him in the car, medical personnel sort of deal with him and, and finish with him, correct? Correct. Were you waiting for them to finish so that you could continue on with what you had to do, which at that point became transporting him? Correct. Okay. So that was mainly your reason to, for waiting around. Let them finish and then continue on? Yeah, I have to wait to, if they decide if they're going to transport or not. Was, and how was that decision accomplished? Through the, through the paramedics. And do you know, were you there? Were you listening? I can overhear bits and pieces. Okay. I was kind of pushed back because there was a crowd around the doorway of the car. Including the paramedics? It was a crowd of paramedics. Gotcha. Mrs. Zimmerman's still in the backseat of your car. Correct. With his legs out on the ground. That's correct and then the paramedics attending to him. Correct. Do you know which one made the decision to transport or not? Which paramedic? I do not. Okay. But it seems that the decision to release him back to you was what was done. Yes. Right? Did you have any impact on that? Like, I want to get him to the station. Are we done here? What's going on? No, sir. Okay. Left that in their hands. Yes, sir. So, He's then released to you. Correct. And um, put him in the back seat of the car. At some point, did you actually have to help him get up out of the car for the rest of the examination where you sort of lifted him up? He was still, I'm sorry, let me start. He was still cuffed in the back seat of the car, correct? Correct. And as he was being treated by medical personnel, you still had to have him cuffed. He was still handcuffed, yes. At that point, all you know is that He's acknowledged having shot somebody. Correct. And you're not going to release somebody under those circumstances just yet. Correct. Okay. So when the medical personnel wanted him lifted up to check the rest of him, did you help lift him up? No, sir. Do you know if another officer did? I don't recall. Do you know how it happened with the medical personnel? If you it, may have been, it may have been two, two of the paramedics lifted him up. Okay. Do you remember that happening? I remember him standing up, but I don't remember who. Okay. It wasn't me. Anyway, that's finished. He's now in the backseat of the car, still cuffed. Correct. Um, and you're taking him back towards SP Sanford Police Department. That's correct. And tell me again of the conversation about feeling lightheaded. He said that he felt lightheaded, had a headache okay. uh, while he was in the backseat of the patrol car. Did that seem to be consistent with his injuries to you? Yes, sir. And did you then call over to Sanford Police Department to figure out what to do with him now that he might have to go to the hospital? I had called the supervisor that was on scene. All right. Do you recall who that was? Sergeant McCoy. And um, tell me of the conversation with Sergeant McCoy. I explained to her the comment he, that he had made about feeling lightheaded. She advised me if, if he wants to go to the hospital, we'll transport him to the hospital. If not, we'll take him to the station. Okay. Did you have a discussion with Mr. Zimmerman that though you could transport him to the hospital, 
the expenses of that would be on his shoulders. I don't recall that, no, sir. It, they would, in fact, though, you would not, SPD doesn't cover expenses if he goes to the hospital, right? I don't believe so. Okay. And then we've learned, um, we've seen the pictures, I'm not going to put them back up right now, but there was one picture after Mrs. Zimmerman had been cleaned up, correct? Correct. Um, those pictures were taken after midnight that night, were they not? I don't know what time they were taken, but it was after. After the initial interview with um, Detective Singleton? Correct. correct. Do you know who cleaned him up at SPD? While at the station, he was given a bottle of water and some tissues. Oh, to sort of clean himself off? Correct. Okay. And is that then how it went from the first picture we saw, the one with him with the blood all over him, to the one where the blood is gone? He was cleaned up some by the fire department on scene and then while he was at the station. Okay. Was there ever a time at Sanford Police Department um, where there was any other videotaping of him that you know of? Not that I'm aware of, no, sir. Okay. Was there ever a time where he needed any physical assistance from you or whatever in helping, leaning against the wall or doing anything like that? No, sir. And you watched him for about 30, I think you said, 30 or 40 minutes before the investigator came in to talk to him, right? Correct. Question him about what had happened? Yes, sir. And did you say that you watched that interrogation or interview? Yes, sir. Okay. Was he cooperative? He appeared to be so. Okay. Did he ever ask for a lawyer during that event? I don't know. Had he asked for one, the interview would have stopped, correct? Yes, sir. I might just have a moment, Your Honor. Thank you. Any redirect? Just briefly, thank you, Judge. Officer Smith, you were asked if when you came into contact with the defendant, he seemed to be angry or frustrated, and you said that he did not. Correct. Do you know what was going on in his head when he pulled the trigger for the bullet that killed Trayvon Martin? Let me interrupt with an objection. I think that's going to be speculation, and I'll object to that. Okay, moment. sustained as a speculation. <coughs> Do you know what he was thinking before you arrived? Your Honor. Well, that's Similarly. a yes or no. I, that, that wouldn't, if the answer is yes, it calls for speculation. If the answer is no, I would suggest it's not relevant. Okay, sustained. You were asked about um, whether or not his firearm was visible when he exposed it to you like this. Yes. And you had a flashlight on him? Yes, sir. Do you know if his firearm was visible when he was out at the location where Trayvon Martin's body was in that lighting? That I don't know. Um, you said at the station you offered uh, the defendant some tissues, uh, like Kleenex? Yes, sir. To clean himself? Yes, sir. Did anybody else clean him at the station? Not that I saw. All right. Could you help me with one photograph? Judge, I'd like to publish one more photograph, if I could. Officer Smith, I'm showing you states 46. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the way the defendant appeared when he was at the police station after he had been cleaned up? Yes, sir. All right, and that was taken um, on the evening of the 26th or perhaps just after midnight uh, into the 27th? Yes, sir. All right, thank you, sir. Judge, that's all I have. A very brief follow-up. I, I think it was just a mistake, but I want to clear it up. 
Mr. Guy, when he suggested his maneuvering for the picture, actually lifted up his left arm. Um, you had testified, however, pretty certainly that the gun was on his right side, correct? Correct. And that he lifted up his right arm. Correct. So you have no question in your mind whatsoever, do you, that the gun was located on his right hip? I, no, I don't. Okay. Mr. Guy is putting it up his left arm was just a mistake as far as you can tell? Correct. Thanks. Nothing further. And any re redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay. May Officer Smith be excused? He may. Thank you very much. You're excused. <coughs> call your next witness, please. Sir, we call Lindsay Folgate. Okay, we'll get you a pad of paper. Just one or? You may proceed. Good afternoon, ma'am. Could you state your name for the record, please? Yes, Lindsay Folgate. And could you spell both names? Yes, L-I-N-D-Z-E-E, -E F O L G A T E. What is your occupation? I'm a physician assistant. And where are you employed? At Altamont Family Practice. Is that located in Altamont Springs, Seminole County, Florida? Correct. Can you briefly tell us about your education and training regarding your occupation, ma'am? Certainly. I am a physician assistant, meaning I... I'm sorry, certain. we've had problems with that microphone. You need to lean up a little bit and you certainly. may need to adjust it. I'm a physician assistant. I underwent four years of an undergraduate degree in a bachelor's of health science. And then subsequent to that, I did two years at a master's of physician, physician assistant studies program at the University of Florida. And you mentioned you obtained your master's when, ma'am? I obtained my master's from June of 2006 to June of 2008. And your master's was in physician's assistant studies? Correct. Uh, are you certified by the state of Florida? Correct. Yes, I am. Please explain what you do and how it is different from a nurse and a, and a doctor. Okay. We can start with a nurse first. As a physician assistant, again, I have my master's degree, um, which is a different level of training than a nurse. I am taught on a medical model in the physician assistant program um, and the purpose after my schooling is to go out and to be able to have direct patient contact with patients um, and be able to diagnose and treat their illnesses. So that's a little bit different than what a nurse can do. Okay. And how about a doctor? How are you different than a doctor? As a physician goes, I, as a physician you have four years of a um, medical school degree and then you go on to do a residency. So we're trained on a similar model, although ours is scaled down to a two-year program, where for the first year I'm in a didactic school year, which is mainly a group of studies. And then the second year is our clinical year where we do different basic rotations. And are you able to do everything that a doctor does except what? I'm able to do most things that a physician can do, except in the state of Florida I cannot um, sign off solely by myself on controlled substances. Okay. And do you have your own patients? I do. Okay. 
How long have you been a physician assistant at uh, Altamont Family Practice? From April of 2011 to the present time. Can you tell us how Altamont Family Practice is set up? I'm assuming if you're a patient, you come in, you're, what are the processes that a patient coming in would be treated? From the beginning, you would like that? Yeah, just very briefly. Okay, briefly, if you were a patient to come into our office, you would enter through the doors, you would greet our front desk staff, they would obtain your insurance and license information, they would give you the paperwork if it had not already been filled out as a new patient. Once that is received, the insurance is verified, then the chart gets put up to be taken back. The medical assistant would come and get the chart, they would take the patient back, they would do vital signs, and then they would get a basic note of why they were being seen in the office that day. And at that point then, would you become involved if that's your patient in treating or uh, assessing the injuries or whatever that wrong, was wrong with the patient? Yes. Okay. Did you have a patient by the name of George Zimmerman? Uh, was he a patient of yours at Altamont Family Practice? He was. And um, do you see that person in the courtroom today, ma'am? I do. Okay. Is that the person who just stood up? That is. Do I yes. reflect the witness that identified defendant George Zimmerman? The record will so reflect. Ms. Falgate, your first contact with the defendant George Zimmerman was that on August the 19th of 2011? Correct. And in terms of dealing with him the first time, was a history obtained from the defendant, Mr. Zimmerman? Yes. Okay. And do you review and personally go over the information that, in this case, Mr. Zimmerman provided to you or to your assistant in making sure that you are documenting everything you need to in order to treat him? Yes. Okay. In order to get what medication and what other possible um, benefit you can provide in assisting him in, in whatever he has a problem Correct. with. Correct. Um, uh, what I want to do is uh, introduce at this time State's Exhibit, uh, make sure I get the right one. State's Exhibit 195, which is the August 19, 2011. If I may approach the witness. Any extension? Approach, yeah. Yes. Approach the court to the up a matter outside your presence, so if you'll please put your notepads face down and follow Corporal Lott back to the um, jury room.
seated. down to the witness room for just a moment. And um, right now we're discussing um, State's Exhibit um, 195, and the objection is to relevance of certain portions. Yes, Your Honor. I, I might, if I might suggest, I, I think that this witness can certainly testify to what she remembers, and she can even use medical records to refresh her recollection. My concern is the, the idea or the contention that the medical records themselves should be admitted. I think that her testimony to the extent this court perceives it to be relevant, should be admitted, but not the medical records. And if, in fact, the medical records are going to be allowed, that they would need to be redacted much more severely than they are. I think this court redacted them for discovery purposes initially, but other matters would now need to be further redacted. And the only thing I think that would not be redacted, not to argue the state's case, is that which documents the injuries <coughs> And there are some other previous records that talk about some exercising, and I understand the state's position on that. The court can make its own ruling. But short of that, I don't think that any other words or comments, history, would be relevant, nor admissible. I guess we'll take it one at a time, Your Honor, as to the exhibit before you, which I believe is State's Exhibit 195. It's dealing with the August 19, 2011 uh, treatment of uh, this defendant. This would establish, uh, I guess, make, if I'm to, through the court asking Mr. O'Mara, he is stating he has no objection to the witness testifying about such matters, but does not want the record itself in, if I understood correctly. I, I believe the witness can testify to relevant matters. And, and I think if we were to look at this first page, I think there's a sentence or two that can be arguably relevant. So if but I, everything else, I would argue, as a medical record, quite protected under our statutes, would not be admissible unless there's particular relevance. I could just, I'll be glad. you can read as quickly as I can, Your Honor. There are just things in there that are not relevant to this case. And there are two sentences, I think, being able to start okay. to exercise. Um, why don't, why don't we come up to the bench and we can go over these um, page by page.
Ready for the jury? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and bring the jury in. Please be seated. <clears throat> you may continue, Mr. De Leonardo. I may proceed, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Fulgate, I was, I think we left off with uh, you having Mr. Zimmerman, the defendant, as a prior patient, as, as a patient back in your first contact with him would have been August the 19th, 2011, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And as part of your uh, contact with the defendant that day, you obtained a history from the defendant, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, 
And when you obtain a history, you actually spoke to them yourself? Correct. They come in with a pre-filled out history that they bring with them, so we have some sort of idea okay. of what their history may be, and then we take the rest of it. All right. I'm going to show you, ma'am, what's been marked, uh, actually introducing the evidence of Stacey Zip at 195. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, And do you recognize that exhibit as part of the medical records that are kept at uh, your family practice, uh, Altamont family practice? Yes. Okay. I, I've highlighted certain parts that I want to ask you specifically about, so if you can just make reference to those. Okay. That, that record would indicate that uh, he was a patient of yours, and it's got his name, George M. Zimmerman, 27 years old, uh, male, race, white. Is that correct? Correct. And it would also have the encounter date, which had been August 19, 2011, at 1.29 p.m.? Correct. Okay. Uh, in terms of the highlighted parts only, can you read the first part, the first sentence of the highlighted part? Of the history of present illness? Yeah, just the highlighted part only. Seen in the office to establish care, referred through insurance provider. In that same paragraph, it also has a highlighted part towards the bottom of that paragraph? Do you Dif see that? Yes. Difficulty with falling and maintaining sleep. Started to exercise intensely with MMA, but this has not helped. I'm sorry, can you repeat that last sentence? Started to... Correct. Difficulty with falling and maintaining sleep. Started to exercise intensely with MMA, but this has not helped. And were you able to determine MMA as being mixed martial arts? Yes. On the notes, I believe there are two sentences that are highlighted, is that correct, in yellow? Yes. And could you read those two sentences? Patient here to establish care. Patient was referred by his insurance list of providers. Ma'am, I'm going to now uh, provide to you, if I could, uh, with the court's permission, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes, you may. You saw subsequent to that, and I want to refer specifically to a date, which is uh, September 23rd, of 2012, and I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 196. Mm -hmm. 2012, that's 2011. I apologize, 2011. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, do you see that exhibit before you, ma'am? I do. Um, your treatment, uh, I'm sorry, you would have had to contact with the defendant again, George Zimmerman, on that day? Correct. And when you say contact, you yourself actually had contact with the defendant? Yes. Okay. Uh, on that day also, when you saw him, you gathered, just, it's got the, that exhibit, it's got the regular information, George M. Zimmerman, 27 years old, uh, male, white, and uh, the date, September 23rd, 2011, at 1.52 p.m., is that correct? Correct. And I believe there's a highlighted part in that uh, page where you've got in terms of social history exercise, is that correct? Correct. And what did you notate there in terms of social history exercises to the defendant, George Zimmerman? That he was involved in mixed martial arts three days per week. Let me get that document back from you if I could, and let me show you State's Exhibit 194. You would have seen him on um, <coughs> I guess on that day when you treated him, did you history was obtained in terms of what he was there for. Yes. Right? Persian complaints of an earache or whatever. Would that have been the same? It would have, you know, it would have been noted on the notes and then yes, we would have discussed okay. what the concerns that he had. Right. Okay. So the history that would have been taken, would that have been first by a medical assistant so you would have an idea of when you talked to him what he was there for? Exactly. Okay. 
And if you could, let's go over in terms of the 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 way you would have dealt with them in terms of, I know you've got a records and they may not be in exact order in the way you treated them, is that correct? Correct. Okay, because this exhibit is a printout of the combined records. Yes. Okay, all right. So if we could, let's start at the very beginning. Your first contact with them, what did you deal with in terms of what you dealt with and what he said he didn't say? On this exact visit? Yes, ma'am. Okay. On, on February the 27th of 2012 at 11.02 uh, a.m. So what would have happened initially is the patient would have been brought back to the room and had vitals done and then a brief history would have been taken by the medical assistant. I then will review that brief history so I have an idea of exactly what I'm going in to see. And then while I enter the room, then we discuss his certain complaints that he was there for. So I guess as is done, I'm assuming every time somebody goes to the doctor, vital signs would have been taken first? Yes. Okay. And then the next part would have been uh, his patient is here for uh, whatever and patient states something. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And if you could, I think that's on page two of, of, of those records. Mm -hmm. uh, patient is here for what? Go ahead and tell us. Patient is here for a return note for work. Patient was in fight on 226 2012. Patient was punched in nose and has two lacerations in the back of head. 911 was called and EMT said patient's nose was broken. I gather when we're talking about right here notes, this is what Mr. Zimmerman is taking the is telling the medical assistant. Correct. Okay. So he's telling the medical assistant that he's there for a return note for work. Correct. That he was in a fight on September, I'm sorry, on February the 26th of uh, 2012, that he was punched in the nose and has two lacerations in the back of the head, that 911 was called, and an EMT said his nose was broken. Correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then you would have reviewed that and then actually had contact with Mr. Zierman. Correct. Okay. So I think we now go to the... I've got it as a front page. I don't know if that's correct. Would that be history of present illness? That is where I would begin. Okay, yes. so you actually would have had contact with him at that time. Correct. And I gather you talk to him, he tells you what his ailment is, and then you would have treated it. Correct. Okay. So if you could tell us at that time when you're talking to him, what he tells you. When we are talking during that time, basically what I've written Hit in the note is what he's telling times. me. And he that states to that say that during the altercation, he had a weapon, that he was authorized to carry a firearm, and he fired at the attacker, killing him. He goes on to mention that he was evaluated by EMS at the scene, um, and he states his lacerations were cleaned during that time. He was told that he had a broken nose and denies being taken to the hospital. He then returned to work and was told he needed a police report and medical clearance to return to work. And then I go into my review of systems and asking him certain questions that he would confirm so or deny. So you first get his statement as to what happened or why he's there. Correct. Okay. And uh, I think the first part is he states today he's complaining of nasal pain. Correct. Okay. Nasal pain would be his nose. Correct. Okay. And then he tells you the history and then you then diagnose what do you do? You go over all the parts of his body or what do you do? After we discuss the history, I ask certain questions which we um, clarify as our review of systems which would be on the following page. Okay. Once we go over the review of systems, I'm basically asking him to confirm or deny certain symptoms that he may be having at the time. And then I move on to the physical examination, which is where I determine what injuries were noted, and then based off of that, what would need to be treated. All right, so let's go back a second and then talk about review of symptoms. Go ahead and cover those, please. Okay. So during the history of present illness, I again asked him if he was having any headaches, change in visual acuity, slurred speech, dizziness or gait abnormality. And then I also asked him, was he having any nausea or vomiting? And then in, in associated with that, any abdominal pain. I then go through and look at the review of systems as well as this is a drop down box menu in our electronic medical record system and review any other medical, or review any other symptoms that may have been involved. All right, so let's take those one by one. Okay. He, he in terms of you asking him, he denied HA, what does HA mean? HA means headache. Okay, so he denies having any headache. Correct. Change in VA, what does that mean? Uh, VA means visual acuity, so okay. no change in vision. He denies any slurred speech, what does that mean? That would mean exactly what it says, but any slurred speech, and sometimes I'll rephrase that to patients as um, 
Are you talking any more abnormal than what you would have normally? He denies dizziness. That's an obvious one, but let's make sure for the record <laughs> what that means. Clarifying to see if he had any dizziness, meaning he felt off balance for any reason. Okay. And gait abnormality, meaning he's able to walk fine, no problems walking. Exactly, and sometimes I'll clarify that on layman's terms, meaning are you walking as if you were drunk or staggering. Okay. Then I notate on the history of pressing illness, he admits to occasional nausea when thinking about the violence last night, but denies the abdominal pain. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? He was telling me that when he was reflecting on what happened that night, that he was having some nauseous feelings. And I would then further ask, are you having abdominal pain to clarify whether the nausea was coming from an abdominal pain symptom or from a psychological factor? And what was your determination as to that? That it was not from his abdominal system, that it was more from a psychological factor. He also, you notated complaints of left SI joint tenderness since the event. Go ahead and tell us what that means. The SI joint is the sacroiliac joint, and he has mentioned that he was having some tenderness on the left side since the altercation that night. And you also notate he denies numbness or tingling or incontinence. Tell us about that. These are follow-up questions I would ask on anyone who would complain of back pain or SI joint tenderness to make sure that there was nothing more severe going on. So was he having any numbness or tingling <coughs> into his extremities, or was he having any bowel or bladder incontinence? Then when you do, do the drop down on the, your computer, I guess, when you say drop down, or you're going through in terms of constitutional symptoms, right? He denies fevers or chills. Correct. His eyes, he doesn't have blurred vision or... Diclopia I mean, means double vision. Okay. Ears, nose, mouth, and, thro and throat. Tell us about that. He admits to nose pain, but has no hearing loss or tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. Why... Why is the, the, what's the significance of that? Tell us about that. What are you looking for? The significance of the tinnitus? Yeah. Um, just making sure with the trauma that he is telling me he sustained, would there be any significant side effects from that and that one of the results could be hearing loss or ringing in the ears. So he has no ringing in the ears or hearing loss? No complaints of that. I'm sorry, no complaints of that. And that's all you can go on that time, is that correct? Correct. Okay. But uh, you've got him here, admits nose pain, and I think we're going to get to this in a little while. Okay. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, cardiovascular, tell us about that. He denies palpitations, meaning any abnormal or irregular heartbeats, and he denies any chest pain or chest pressure. Respiratory? Respiratory denies any shortness of breath. Okay. Tell us about the next, next few other ones. The gastrointestinal denies abdominal pain, nausea, and or vomiting related to the gastrointestinal system. Okay. The integumentary, that's the skin, so I put in there admit scalp lacerations because that is one of his concerns. Neurological will be next. Admits to head trauma as he's telling me that he sustained a head trauma that night based on the story that he's telling me, but denies tingling, numbness, weakness, headache, dizziness, speech difficulty, gait disturbance, or loss of consciousness. And then the last part would be psychiatric. He admits to stress surrounding the event, but denies suicidal thoughts or attempts. Go back to neurological in terms of admits head trauma. Why are you concerned about whether he has uh, difficulty with speech or he's got headaches or whether he's lost consciousness? What's the significance of that? The significance of those review of systems or symptoms would be more concerning or lead me to down another line of questioning, um, and that would further potentiate this certain treatment that I would so elicit. You I'm sorry, I interrupted okay. you. So you have no concerns in terms of he, he says he's not losing consciousness, he's able to write, mm -hmm. able to function fine. Uh, he has no problem in terms of uh, concentration or weakness or headaches or anything like that? Correct. Okay. If, you, if he had complained of those, what steps would you have taken in treating those if those existed? It would also be based off my physical exam, so I would take those symptoms into consideration while I'm doing the physical exam. And pending some of those who are apparent, and you would rank those on certain severity, then you would proceed with possible imaging, okay. meaning a picture of the brain. So at this point, you had no concern about, I know we're going to get to the physical, but based on just this, you have no concern regarding that at this point? Based on what he's telling me, there is less concern, correct. Okay. All right, I guess we then, is, am I skipping a step or are you going now to physical exam? I would go next to the physical exam. Okay, if you could just cover that, um, please, thank you. No problem. So the first part of the physical exam would be his general appearance. Um, it says he's in no acute distress, 
Most of the time that means is he any physical shortness of breath or significant pain at the time. He is obese and that's based off his body max index which in, takes into account his height and weight. He's Let me interrupt you, I uh -huh. apologize. The, is his height and weight anywhere on here? His height and weight would be on the first page. Okay, I the, neglected to ask you about that, sorry. In the vital signs, saying he's five foot 7.5 inches and weighs 204 pounds. Five and foot seven and how much? 7.5, seven and a half. Okay, and then what else, what was his weight? 204 pounds. Okay. I apologize. I interrupted you. No problem. You then, stated also he, he is obese, and is that you based on what now? That's based off his body mass index, which takes into account your height and weight. A BMI greater than 31 falls into a category of obesity. What's the next uh, sentence you've got there under general appearance? He is alert and oriented and appears, and appears his stated age. Anything significant with that? I would take that into account given the history of the head trauma to make sure that he's alert and is understanding the questions that I'm asking him. Okay. Go ahead. Next would be head. He's normocephalic, atraumatic. The face is symmetric. Two scalp lacerations to the occiput, which is the back part of the head. Approximately 2 centimeters and 0 0.5 centimeters respectively. Okay. Tell me the significance of that. Um, the the significance of the measurement itself? Yes, yeah. Tell me the measurements and in terms of, uh, you use some big words there. Uh, tell, okay. tell me what you mean by those big words there. Okay. Um, the significant would be two lacerations, meaning two cuts to the back of his head. And the occiput, again, is the back part of the head. They, I measure them given his concerns and his complaints to have that documented to make sure that we know should these not heal appropriately, these were the original size that he came in to be seen for. And you said two centimeters and a point five centimeters. What Correct. is that in, in uh, inches? I guess. How, 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 or can you estimate using your finger? I guess, or using your uh, how, how small are they? Okay, two centimeters would approximately be about this big, and then zero point five is much smaller. Okay. And based on your observations and, and uh, review of those uh, lacerations, did you feel there was any anything that Anything additional that needed to be done regarding those, like uh, any kind of stitches or anything like that? That determination is based on how well the skin edges are what we call approximated, which means how well are they together to begin with, they, and how deep is the laceration itself. Based off of the approximation of the skin margins and the depth of the lacerations, I did not feel that sutures were necessary. And a laceration, tell us what that means when you say a laceration versus a cut or something like that. A laceration is basically um, a more proper term for a cut. Okay, and you said it wasn't deep enough to require, in your opinion, any uh, stitches or anything, is that correct? Correct. And you said the skin edges were, were approximated well, if I've got that right? Correct. Okay, tell me about the eyes. Eyes, it says P-E-R-R-L-A, which means pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light and the extraocular movements are intact. So I'm checking his pupils to make sure they're responding to light appropriately. And then we check the um, extraocular movements, meaning how well are his eyes moving in each direction. And that was normal. And then it says conjunctiva and sclera are clear. The conjunctiva and sclera are, for lack of a better word, the, right, the white parts of your eyes. So making sure that there's no in injection into that part. But I did note that he had bilateral black eyes. And what does that mean to you? That would mean skin discoloration to the inferior orbit, meaning the bottom portion of the eyes. Okay. Going back to the head, to I guess the skull, the scalp, whatever, you notice those lacerations. Did you notice any other trauma to the head at all? I did not at the time. I don't recall. So let's talk about the ears, nose, mouth, and throat. Bruising noted to the nasolabial folds bilateral with swelling. The nasolabial folds would be the folds between the nose and the mouth. And there was some swelling noted there and some bruising, so darkening of the skin. No evidence of septal deviation on visual inspection, meaning the septum, which is the center part of your nose, appeared to be straight and in alignment. No bleeding noted in the nares, which means there was no blood in the nose itself. No hemotympanin to the bilateral ears, which means there's no blood behind the eardrums. And no evidence of tonsillar stones, which was a complaint that he had outside of the current reason that he was there.
So let's talk about the nose itself. No evidence of septal deviation. What does that mean? So septal deviation, again, would mean is the alignment of the, of the nose correct? So his nose is straight, in other words? Correct. It is not crooked or in any way damaged to that extent? Is not on visual inspection, no. I think you've already covered the chest and um, his heart, et cetera, everything else seemed normal? Correct. You, uh, you talked about the tender left SI, correct? Correct. Okay. And tell me a little bit about that again. The SI, again, is the sacroiliac joint, which is the space located, for lack of a better word, in the center of your buttocks. Okay. Um, I think we've, you gave him some medicine for the um, complaint he had, is that correct? For the SI joint pain, correct. Yes. And what did you give him? We gave him Lodine, which is an anti-inflammatory. Okay. By the way, when you saw him regarding those lacerations, did he have any band-aids or anything covering them? He did have one large band-aid covering them. Okay. And I'm assuming, or maybe it's an assumption on my part, did you remove the band-aid to look at him? Correct. Okay. Um, you mentioned that he said, that is, Mr. Zimmerman told you that the EMT had told you that the nose was either broken or possibly broken, is that correct? That was what I was told, correct. Okay. Based on your examination of his nose, can you say that his nose was broken? I would say likely broken. It's hard to say definitively based off of the fact that there were no x-rays to show the break itself. However, most of the time, a broken nose can be made clinically as well, and that's based off of the black eyes that we saw, the nasolabial swelling, the bruising. Okay. So you can say it is or it isn't, or you don't know, or? I couldn't say definitively one way or the other because I have no direct x-ray saying this is exactly where the fracture occurs. But clinically appearing, it appeared to be, yes. Okay, all right. Um, but it was still perfectly straight. It was still straight. There was no septal deviation. I think you've got in terms of the plan decision making progress is that what you would move on to next after the physical exam yes i would move to the plan and the decision making process you talked about the uh, scalp lacerations that there was no sutures needed in other words you didn't need any um sewing nope. up at all right no stitches correct okay and you stated in terms of broken nose that we discussed it is likely broken but does not appear to have cpa Septal uh, deviation, swelling, and black eyes are typical of this injury, correct? Correct. Now, you're there. Did you then recommend something to him in terms of making a definitive determination of whether his nose is broken or whether there would be any problems regarding that? My recommendation was that he see an ENT, which is an ears, nose, and throat specialist. Okay. And did, what did he say regarding that? He told me at the time that he was not going to go to be seen by the ENT. Regarding the uh, SI joint pain, did you give him some uh, suggestions? We discussed using the loading, which is the anti-inflammatory, to help with the inflammation. And then we discussed heat, ice, and massage. Um, You had seen him the, the three times we, we covered here, but you had seen him at other times that he complained on a prior occasion of having some back pain of some type. Do you recall that? I do. Okay. And had you treated him for that before? I had. It was related to constipation. Okay. So it was not related to an injury itself, like a physical injury? Correct. Okay. Let me have a moment, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I apologize. In terms of laceration to the head, you mentioned two of them. Mm -hmm. I got a bald head, so I know what it is to get cut or have the laceration. How do those bleed in, in, in distinguishing that from a cut somewhere else in the body? 
in terms of is there something with the head the fact that it bleeds more profusely or doesn't it tell me about that the head is very the scalp is very vascular meaning it has many blood vessels there so a scalp laceration can bleed quite a significant amount more than perhaps somewhere else on the body depending on the location and how about if the person doesn't have any hair it doesn't necessarily mean that it will bleed less but maybe less noticeable um, because there would be maybe some <coughs> hair blocking that area. In other words, if you have hair, it would be either have more of an impact of cushion or you just wouldn't notice that there was bleeding. Possibly both. Um, you may not notice the amount of blood because it could be getting mixed up with the hair itself. Um, and I guess it would depend on the thickness of your hair <laughs> to depend on the amount of cushion that would be. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Mara. Yes, thank you. I might. No, I will need a little assistance. My enthusiast. May I recruit you for a moment? Thank you very much, Ron. Actually, it will be a few minutes before I need this, oh. so yeah, I'll thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi. I'm going to focus, again, he was a patient of yours for a while before the event where he came to you on February 27th, correct? Correct. Uh, but just to start with the last question first. He did not have any back pain caused by back injury before this event, correct? No. The back injury was actually internal concern that showed itself as a back pain. Right? Correct. We believed it was likely related to the constipation when he complained right. about that in the past. So that when he came to you on the 27th, that was the first time he had ever complained of back pain? Yes. This was okay. unrelated. Okay, let's focus then on that night. Okay. Um, the day, make sure I do this right, so give me a moment. <clears throat> this, um, oh yes, thank you very much, Your Honor, I promise. Is this close to how he presented to you that day? From what I recall, similar? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. This was, just to orient you, this was taken the night before. Okay. Maybe 12 hours or so before you saw him. Okay. Um, and was that pretty similar to the way he presented to you? Fairly similar. Okay. It's a different picture when you're seeing it on a picture rather than up close, but... Certainly. Yes. Certainly. And, and I apologize for that, but... Um, sorry, I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit. May I approach the witness with the exhibit that's already in evidence? You probably have not seen this picture before, have you? I have not. If this person presented himself, you know that to be George Zimmerman? Yes. Okay. If this person had presented himself to you, looking like this, mm -hmm. what would you have done for him? If he had come to our office looking like that, we would have cleaned the wounds so we could better evaluate what the type of injuries that are and then go about the same process that we went through and then order the testing based off of that. Okay, and if you look at this photograph as compared to the one we just identified, yes. I would like to focus your attention to the nose area. Okay. Would you... Object as to relevance and also she didn't see him like that, so I object as to speculation at this point. My response? Let me hear, let me hear the rest of the okay. questions. Would you agree that the swelling that you saw in that picture has gone down from the way it is here. It looks like that it's decreased slightly. 
Is that normal? Uh, let's say that, that, that there's a 12 hour, let's say that there's a four hour difference, five hour difference between this picture and that picture. Is that a normal uh, sort of receding of swelling? It depends on what he's using to help keep the swelling down. So maybe if he was using anti-inflammatories or icing the area, then potentially, yes, the swelling so could be less. would we expect an injury of this significance to look like that five hours later? Is that normal? Yes, it could. Once it's cleaned up? Correct. But would you agree that in this picture that the nose is in fact more swollen than it is in that picture? It does appear to be, yes. Okay. And why is that? What happens to the body that it heals itself like that? The body naturally tries to take care of itself if it can, and the body responds to trauma in a certain way, and that is why the body produces swelling. And then as the body is recovering, that's how the swelling resolves. Again, it also depends on the certain extraneous things that you're using, like anti-inflammatories or ice to the area. So while this may look as though it is now a bone protrusion to the right side of the nose, it's not actually a bone protruding out there, is it? It's or unlikely in the sense that it's resolved and looks like that okay. picture later. Yet the body swells up at point of injury, does it not? It does, it can, and yes. And it does that in response to the trauma of the hit, correct? It can, yes. And it does that by swelling and the swelling, if you would, just sort of tell us what the body, why the body swells or how the body swells up in the area of trauma. The body itself is reacting to the impact of something that's happened. So certain blood can rush to the area or more fluid underneath the skin can rush to that area and that's what produces the effect of the swelling. Including lymph fluid, doesn't that sort of wander over? And White blood cell, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, white blood cells? They can, potentially. That's the purpose of the lymph system to help with infections sure. or foreign bodies, things like that. Particularly when we know that there's bleeding mm -hmm. happening, correct? Mm -hmm. Bleeding, I would, you would agree, sort of indicates broken blood vessels? It can, yes. Blood and vessels or capillaries. And would you agree that there was bleeding inside the, is it nares or just the, the nares? Nares. Likely there was bleeding inside the nares if you see it coming down the front of the face. Okay. Yes. What, where does that blood go if you're just standing up like I am and my nose is bleeding? Normally gravity will pull it down. How about if I'm laying on my back? Where is the blood going to go? What will happen is you can swallow some of that back down your throat. Actually, it can go into the sinuses as well, can it? It can. Um, and as it goes back down the sinuses, it goes into the back of your throat? It can, And correct. you actually can be swallowing your own blood, correct? You, you can. That what may give you the taste in your mouth, correct. Okay. The swelling that we've just spoken about is the body's initial reaction to trauma, correct? It is. And it only can last maybe just a few hours, correct? It depends on the level of the trauma and the patient, but yes. Does that diminish the fact that the body was in fact traumatized as we see in this picture? Meaning does it make it any less plausible that the body sure. was attacked? Yeah. No. Okay. It, it's a natural reaction for the body to begin its healing process immediately, correct? Correct. And of course, this face was cleaned up um, after the, the blood was all removed and, and can't bear, can you see, well, you can barely still see the cut just at the top of the bridge in those there, correct? Correct. Would you acknowledge that there was in fact a larger laceration or cut on the nose here? There appears to be, but it appears to have blood surrounding the area as okay. well. Again, once you clean it up, it looks a little bit better. Correct. Have you seen this picture before? I have not. Okay. Um, would the scalp bleed in a fashion like this from those two lacerations? It can. The scalp, again, is very vascular, meaning there are plenty of blood vessels on the scalp surface that could cause bleeding like that. Okay. Would it bleed down the back that way? Again, gravity would start to pull that down. Okay. Spend a moment, Your Honor, the lights, if you would. I want to show you some other pictures. 
of Mr. Zimmerman that night. Now, can you see that photograph? I can. Okay. Do you note additional areas of swelling on this picture that you may not have noticed on your physical evaluation? I'm sorry, Ron, that is State's Exhibit 57. <coughs> Let me point you, do you see anything in this area of swelling? There is swelling there that I can see. Okay. Yes. Would that also possibly have resolved itself in the few hours, in the 12 hours between this picture and when you saw him? It could have, yes. Okay. Do you see an area up here that seems to be misshapen? In the photograph, yes, I see that. Okay. Would that also be an area of swelling? It's normally an area of swelling. We call those scalp hematomas, where blood can pool under the skin. Tell me how that occurs. How does a scalp hematoma occur? A hematoma can occur through trauma, so some sort of trauma to the head that resulted in the collection of blood there or fluid there. So in effect, in sort of layman's terms, if I was to smash my head against something, let's say I hit this part, the trauma would cause blood or maybe lymph system fluid to flood that area. Yes. Similar to the nose, it would go there, do its job, and then sort of recede. Correct. And that's what causes swelling, as we know it? Correct. And that's what caused it here, maybe? It could, yes. And that's what caused it up here? It could, yes. You see these, right? Yes. And those the lacerations that you, you identified? Those were the two, correct. Okay. What is the potential outcome from head trauma like that? It, again, depends on the physical exam of the patient, um, and you base a lot of that off the physical exam of the patient. Um, but any sort of head trauma can, can result in an internal injury, meaning bleeding into the brain, skull fractures. And an internal hematoma, is that dural hematoma? It depends on where the blood is actually. You can have an epidural or subdural hematoma. Okay. That um, may or may not have external um, notice, correct? You can have an internal hematoma, subdural hematoma, epidural hematoma, bleeding on beneath the scalp that will resolve itself, correct? An, ep an epidural or subdural hematoma would be below the skull. Right. Um, that's the difference between a hematoma, which is above the skull between the skin. Right. Hematoma outside of skull. Correct. Resolves itself sort of between the skull and the skin. Correct. And then subdural or epidural is you actually have gone below the skull and you're just in that dura, which is what cushions the brain. Correct. And you could have injuries like this could certainly cause a epidural or a subdural hematoma, correct? Not necessarily the lacerations themselves, but if there was head trauma, completely. I'm sorry. So if I just went up to this head and cut it, with um, a razor blade or a scalpel that would not, you would imagine, cause a subdural or epidural hematoma. No. But if I took that same skull and let's say smashed it on concrete, sufficient enough to cause that injury. So mm -hmm. smash might be a term of art, but getting that injury by having your head hit against cement, could that cause a subdural epidural hematoma? That could, depending on how hard the impact was. And that would, in fact, be an injury below the skull in the area where the brain is. Correct. Which is one of the reasons why you do what you do in your evaluation to make sure that he can still focus his eyes and still speak, because you're concerned at that point with any head trauma that there may be some brain injury. Correct. And you, your, your charge then at that point is to um, to rule out that possibility, though you would agree that possibility exists whenever you have an injury like this. It can, yes. Okay. Close up of the same thing, you still see the swelling again up on this area and right in here? Correct. Can you see 
that injury up there or that, that occurrence up there? I can see what maybe appears to be an abrasion of the scalp. Is that, um, what would you call that? Is that punctate, a bruising or? It can be or it depends on what the surface was that maybe caused the injury and it could be an abrasion which is basically just a thin layer of the skin coming off. What are pun punctate injuries? Just explain that. Punctate injuries would be injuries to the blood vessels themselves causing punctate bleeding or small sort of capillary bursts like that. Would that occur if you had your head hit against something as irregular but flat as concrete? It could. Is that a way to occur to get those little mini bruising, middle bruisings all over the place? If it was hit on concrete or anything like that, the rough surface of that could have caused that too. Okay. Consistent with it being hit on concrete, isn't it? It can be consistent with that, whether or not that is what it was struck on. It, I'm sure that can happen on multiple other surfaces as well, but if, um, it could be consistent. Okay. If Mr. Zimmerman were to come to you and say he had that injury and that it occurred because his head was hit on concrete, would it be consistent? She actually has some speculation now. I, I think she's already testified. Okay. I'll that. move on then. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any injury right there? I don't recall that injury. Can you tell us what that looks like to you? It looks like it may be a scratch of the skin or an abrasion of the skin as well. Okay. And now let's look up here at that injury there. What is that? Can you? Identify what that is. It looks like there may be some mild swelling there. Another um, bruise. It's and hard to tell if there was if there's an actual bruise or discoloration of the skin, but it does appear there's some swelling. Oh, I'm sorry. But it, would we just characterize that in layman's term? That's a bump on the head. Correct. Well, how would that come? How how would you get something like that? Again, it can come from hitting your head on any sort of surface, potentially, or being struck by something. Okay. Can you also see the same type of punctate um, injury right around here? I can see that. As far up as here? You see that? It appears to be. Correct. And as down low as here? Correct. As what you testified before, sort of the same? It appears to be, yes. And I'm sorry, Your Honor, I'm not identifying the exhibits. That's number 66 that the witness is testifying concerning. And do you see this area right there of swelling from this ridge here down to this ridge? Can you see that? It's hard to tell in this picture from a side view. Okay. Um, can you see this injury here? And can you identify what that is? Objection as to leading from this aspect in terms of testifying, Mr. Romero testifying there's injuries there without this witness saying that there is. Okay. <coughs> Sustained as to the word injury. Um, okay. Rephrase your question. I will. Um, can you see anything in this area that I'm circling? There appears to be an abrasion there. Okay. And um, again, an abrasion consistent with that head being hit on concrete? It can be consistent with that, yes. And that was 68, Your Honor, if I didn't identify it. Now looking at States Exhibit 69, let me ask you to pay attention to this area right here. Is that the abrasion that you were looking, that you were identifying earlier? It appears to be the same. And the, just to the, going back, can you see that as an area of swelling as well? Um, it does appear to be swelling. Unfortunately, some of that you have to take into account on a physical exam of how that area feels during the time. So it's difficult to get in a picture. You have certain it, head shapes as well. Okay. And again, with, um, this may well have resolved itself in the 12 hours or so beside, be time when the picture was taken and when you saw him. It could, it could potentially have, yes. And do you see similar, what do you see up in this area on the, what would be above his left eye? It's Can you see that? Slightly shaded, but possibly another abrasion up there as well. And can we see then the lacerations in the area around the lacerations on this side? I can see those, yes. 
can you see, is that the area that we talked about before with the misshapen skull? It appears to be. At the top. <clears throat> now let's look at this side to orient it. This uh, is State's Exhibit 70 and his right side of his skull, correct? Okay. What do you see, what is here? Again, it looks like it could be some swelling with the abrasions that we noted before. And how about this area up here, additional? Additional abrasions. Um, would that abrasion itself come from its own strike upon something? That would be hard to determine. And how about the one up here? Again, it would be difficult to determine if it was from its own strike. And the one over here? Same, same thing. Do we get now a better view of the misshapen area on the back of his skull from this perspective? There appears to be possible swelling there or the misshape of his skull itself. I think we've testified to, and this is State's Exhibit 71, you've testified to these areas and also this bruising up here, correct? Correct. <coughs> a, if I might, Exhibit 74, this is a close-up of the area of the lacerations. Can you better ex ex describe for me what you see here as far as additional areas of swelling around the lacerations? There appears to be swelling around the lacerations which would be consistent with a trauma that elicited the laceration itself. Meaning that whatever caused the laceration was also at the same time the sort of compression injury that we talked about earlier? Or your, your it could, and that could cause the swelling, correct. Okay consistent, all of it, with being hit on concrete, is it not? It could be consistent, yes. If the complaint was that that head was hit on concrete, would you consider that consistent with the injuries that you see? I would. Thank you very much, Your Honor, for the lights. Thank you. Now let's spend just a minute on the report itself. Um, Mr. Dillariondo had already gone over it, so I'm just going to hit some high points on okay. it, if I might. His um, vital signs, blood pressure, 130 over 80. Correct. A concern for an, a 28-year-old? Slightly high on the systolic side, but from what I remember in the past, he's never had a problem with high blood pressure before. But not a, not a good high blood pressure, right? You'd like to see it lower? Ideally, we like to see it 120 over 80 or less, but I wouldn't be a cause of concern at 130. Pulse at 109. That is high. Ideally, we see this around 70 to 80. Mm -hmm. uh, evidencing what to you? That there, an increased pulse rate can be related to stress or to trauma. Um, it can also be related to multiple other things, something to do with your heart, causing you know, um, some sort of cardiac condition. Nonetheless, again, not in, not in top shape, huh? It's not where we would like it to be. And how about the BMI? The BMI is 31.48. Meaning again, that he is clinically obese. Correct, based on BMI classification. Okay. And again, not healthy. Ideally, that's not the healthy range, normally between 19 to 25 or 26. Not athletic. It doesn't necessarily mean someone's not athletic with a BMI of 31. It just means it's not at the ideal range of what the standards of health for BMI would be. Okay. And you've gone through um, the actual injuries that you identify. We talked for a moment about the SI injury. Correct. Um, is that injury consistent with falling on your back, or I guess in the buttocks area, did you say? It can be, yes. Okay. When you get that type of SI pain, SI is... Sacroiliac. Sacroiliac. Correct. And that's basically at the base of your spine. It's not necessarily right at the base of your spine. Your spine comes down in a straight. It would be where each side of the buttocks are. It would be directly in the center of that. 
So you have and, one on each side. And how does a injury like that occur? An SI joint injury can occur through trauma or through a fall. Um, sometimes people have SI joint from an improper stretching technique or through some sort of athletic type of performance. He had reported to you that he was hit in the nose, correct? Correct. By his attacker. Correct. Uh, was that consistent with the picture I showed you here of his nose or nasal injuries? Is that consistent with getting punched in the nose? That would be consistent. And is the SI injury that he talked to you about consistent with being thrown on the ground on your back? It would be consistent. The only way to really identify whether or not a nose is, quote, broken is with an x-ray, correct? That would be the definitive way to okay. decide if there was a nasal fracture. It would be a bit easier for you to be conclusive in the determination of broken nose if you actually saw a complete septal deviation, right? Clinically, if there was more of a septal deviation, then there could possibly be a more definitive answer to that. So if the whole nose was literally pointed off in one direction or the other, pretty obvious that there's a break, correct? Correct. But short of that, then you would need to have an x-ray in order to get that accomplished. Correct. And that was the reason why you had referred him to an ENT. Correct. To document what you could not document in your office. Correct. You don't do nose or nasal or face head and x-rays in the office. Correct? We do not. It's not okay. in our scope of practice. And did he tell you that he wasn't going to go to the ENT because of the um, high deductible on his insurance policy? I don't recall there being a discussion over cost or deductible. Do you remember him talking to you about what it would cost for that type of, of evaluation? I don't recall that. Okay. Is that something that you would have noted or just a conversation with him? He may have had that in a conversation that I don't recall. It also wouldn't change my opinion of where to send him or to not send him. And you were firm in your opinion of a couple of things. One, that he needed to see an ENT for Correct. the nose injury. Correct. Even though it was reduced to the better than the cleaned up picture we looked at, right? Correct. Because that went from this picture to that picture in four hours, mm -hmm. and you had another 12 hours of the swelling to go down. Correct. But even still, you wanted an ENT consult. Yes, because there can be residual effects of a nasal fracture if it's not taken care of. And you also suggested, based upon the conversation that you had with him, that he should get a psychological consult, correct? Correct. Why is that? He was already seeing a psychologist, and in my professional opinion, if someone is to go through the sort of ordeal that he went through the night before of what he's telling me, then I would recommend that anybody go see a psychologist. Did he come across to you as though he was trying to make certain that you would document his injuries consistent with being attacked? I don't recall that. Okay. Was he just reporting the symptoms as they seemed to exist? Yes. He wasn't, from your perspective, he wasn't trying to use you as some shill to come up with an excuse or a reason or a medical reason for his injuries, was he? It did not appear that way. Okay. Was, in fact, all of his complaints documented by your evaluation? They were. And those injuries actually did exist, correct? They did. And in addition, the psychological concern that you had, in your professional opinion, that existed as well, didn't it? It did, and that would have existed for anybody who came in with what he was concerned about or what had taken place that night. Particularly as documented or supported by the injuries that he sh showed or exhibited to you. Supported by that. <laughs> What we didn't note in the cleaned up picture, you know the one I'm talking about mm -hmm. when I say that? Yes. We didn't note any black eyes on that picture, did you? I didn't notice them from the picture, no. So tell me, as the body begins to heal itself, we know that it rushes to the area of trauma, as you said, right? Correct. And then it sort of recedes. Correct. Well, what's the timeline on those eyes to go black? Sometimes the black eyes can become more apparent at a later date. That's not necessarily an initial event that happens. Most of the time swelling comes to the area, then the swelling may recede, and then something like the black eyes can occur after that. 
because the black eyes are actually residual blood that has escaped the capillaries and just sort of pools in the soft pockets of the under the eyes, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So you don't expect to see a, blood, a black eye a moment or 10 minutes or an hour even after a punch in the nose, do you? Not necessarily that quickly. But it was, is it consistent that if he had gotten punched in the nose, let's say 716 the night before, that when you saw him 11 a.m. in the morning, mm -hmm. that his eyes would be blackened? They could be, yeah. It was consistent with what I saw on <laughs> my physical exam. And they were, in fact, two black <coughs> eyes, correct? They were. I mentioned a moment ago, you know, was he trying to sort of somehow make up or document significant injuries? And I think you said he wasn't. Not from the impression that I had. On the other side, was he trying to even minimize his injuries and, and get it behind him? Uh, did you get any of that feel with him telling you he wasn't going to an ENT and he just wanted a note to get back to work? I don't recall that per se, him having that certain effect. Okay. And um, Mr. DeLeonda asked you about the, the bandage. Obviously, you were taking that off. Um, was, did that seem to be an appropriate bandaging to do for that injury? That was fine, given that the skin edges were well approximated and the scalp lacerations were not that deep. I didn't feel like any, if you're referring to something like a butterfly bandage or a butterfly stitch was necessary at the time. Right. It wasn't, you didn't look at that bandage um, like when we're kids or something and just have a little, little cut and a four inch by four inch bandage. You didn't look at that and, and wonder why would someone put a bandage that size on two injuries of that size, did you? No. Did it seem appropriate that it be bandaged? Yeah, it was appropriate to keep the lacerations covered. And particularly, let's say if it was a nursing student who was looking at that injury, would it make sense as a nursing student to, to um, cover an open wound? Yes. Speculation. I'll, I'll rephrase it. <clears throat> Thank you. If you saw those wounds on the back of the head, you know the ones we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. If you saw those wounds, would you clean them off and put bandages over them? I would likely have them cleaned, and if the patient desired, I would put a bandage over them. It doesn't necessarily have to be bandaged, but there would be no problem with doing that to keep certain debris out of the area. Right. And um, we talked a bit about what happens when you fall down, and Mr. Deliriano used himself as a model, and I might use myself as a model, that I may not get as injured because I have hair than someone who doesn't have hair. Is that? I don't know if that would necessarily be true. I guess it would depend on the thickness of your hair. Okay. Um, but I don't think that you would be any less injured based off having hair or not having hair. Okay. It would be more apparent with somebody who back then didn't have hair to cover the injuries, but the injuries are what they are, correct? They are what they are, yes. And certainly, whoever may have inflicted those injuries knew how much hair was on the body that they were inflicting the injuries upon, correct? That's just speculation. Did you ask Mrs. Zimmerman if he had cut his hair in the past 14 hours? I had not asked that question. I'm going to have a moment, Your Honor. Thank you very much for your time, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any redirect? You mentioned something that I was curious about. You we were talking about the shape of the head. Yes. I guess we all think the head is perfectly shaped, our skull. Is that always true? It's not necessarily always Tell true. Tell me a little bit about that, if you could. Um, 
everybody's head shape is completely different. Um, obviously, most people you don't notice because they have hair on their head, so it depends on what that may look like. Um, but everybody can have certain abnormalities of the skull. So in other words, people may have a bump there just pre-existing and it may not be caused by trauma. It could be, correct. Right. So you had an opportunity, you were showing a lot of photographs. Can you pull those up again? Sorry. It's, it's still like, yeah. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. Just go back? Okay. You were showing a lot of photographs. I'm going to go through them real quickly. You're not saying that those were all stuff that occurred the day before or the night before, all that, are you? It would be hard to determine that based off just a photo. Most okay. of that will be based off physical exam as well. Thank you. I think I'm through with the photographs, Your Honor. And my point is, you actually saw him as a live person. In other words, you actually looked at his head. Correct. Right? You looked at his head and he had less hair than Mr. Guy here, but you looked, and I'm assuming you didn't just kind of kind of glance, you actually looked at his head. Correct. Right? To examine. Correct. And all you saw in your examination was two lacerations, correct? That was all I noted. I'm saying you didn't see it, you didn't document any other stuff that we've been talking about, all this trauma. You didn't know you didn't notice that at all. At the time that wasn't documented, I don't recall if there was some swelling that I didn't potentially possibly put in my note. Okay. At this time, do you recall, or at that time, did you recall, did you notate any other swelling other than the lacerations? Those were the only two things that I noted. Okay. So, and by the way, you mentioned if it could, uh, let's speculate and say that those were all trauma-caused hematomas or whatever. Those were apparently cleaned up by the time they saw you, right? By the time he saw you the next day? The swelling was minimized, yes. Okay. So what that took away basically was what, maybe an aspirin or two or a Tylenol or two or what, or it just did naturally? Depends. The body will help to react naturally and then also it depends on what sort of, again, exogenous things you may be using. So you're not saying that that is severe trauma in any way? I don't know if I would say it's not severe or not. I mean, he does have two scalp lacerations and I'm basing that off what his complaints are when he comes in. His so. history, in other words. Exactly. But you only notated two lacerations in the whole thing. Those are the only things that I documented, yes. And I apologize. You notated also his nose. But I'm talking about the back of his head, all the skull. You only noticed two actually lacerations. Those were the most, those were the things I was looking for the most because those were the things that we discussed personally. Okay. And when you did the whole exam in terms of nausea, or I'm sorry, about dizziness, uh, being able to be whether he's conscious or not, you, you ruled all of those out. No trauma to the head, correct? I'm ruling those out based on what he's telling me, and then I then base that off my physical exam, depending on his neurological exam, to make sure all of that seems appropriate. And, and so you ruled all that out? It seemed like he was neurologically intact, yes. Okay, so he didn't have any brain injury is what I'm going to. There doesn't mean that you can't have a brain injury, meaning a concussion from a trauma, but it did not appear to be anything that would require imaging because he wasn't complaining of those specific symptoms. And you also did not notice any, correct? You didn't... Uh, Sorry, I, uh, can you rephrase the no. question? You, he, he gave you a history in terms of no, he wasn't complaining of trauma to his head, exactly. correct? He wasn't, he did complain of trauma to his head, meaning he had the lacerations. I and, apologize, yeah. other than that. And, Again, the story that he told me of his head being struck against the ground. So he did complain of head trauma. But from what I'm looking at based on my physical exam and doing his neurological testing, everything appeared to be intact. And because of that, I didn't order the additional testing. Because if you had noted something, you would have ordered additional testing. At the time, exactly. Right. I also mentioned that what are the signs to look for should something like that occur and if that were to occur then additional testing would be ordered and you never required any is that correct I was never notified of anything as a change okay so did any of the injuries require anything for treatment other than minor cleaning cleaning etc <clears throat> for the most part they required cleaning to the area and then again we don't know the definitive diagnosis of the nasal fracture, which may have required additional treatment, but that was and, not completed. And you recommended that he go to an ENT, and he told you he wasn't going? At the time, from what I recall, yes, he was not okay. going to go. And Mr. O'Mara asked you about that he said, or possibly said, that he didn't have insurance. He, you don't recall that, him ever saying that, do you? I don't recall that discussion. And, and I think you notated already, but you did 
note in your um, records as to, I'm sorry, February 27th, that he came in because he needed a note for work. Is that correct? Correct. He didn't come into your office and say, God, I've got all these head injuries. Um, I, I can't think. I'm, 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 I can't walk. I can't function. He didn't come in complaining about that, did he? That w the major concern that was taken by the medical assistant was that he needed of what happened and then that he needed the return for work, yes. You mentioned also that uh, in terms of psychological that you suggested, but that he was also already seen a psychologist, is that correct? He was already established with a psychologist, yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I have a moment. Um, going back to uh, August 19, 2011, I don't know if we, I removed that document. That was the first time you would have had contact with him. Correct. Um, Mr. Zimmerman talked about his exercise routine, that he was taking mixed martial arts classes, right? Correct. In Your Honor, that would be outside the scope of cross-examination, and this is redirect. Sustained. Your Honor, I'll be glad to approach the bench regarding something that I want to show her. Well, that wasn't brought up in cross-examination, so it's outside the scope. Yes, Your Honor, but may we approach the bench yes, in another may. matter? Fulgate, when um, Mr. Zimmerman talked about in terms of the exercise routine, uh, in terms of MMA, et cetera, he talked about doing it three days a week and three hours a day. Is that correct? Correct. Finally, ma'am, what kind of symptoms would you expect from a gunshot wound to the heart? What kind of yeah, symptoms would that cause? Your Honor, that would be outside, actually outside his direct and outside my cross. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank just, you. Just Henry. a couple because what we're going to, might you see the last piece that you referenced to her? I have mine, but yours is. Uh, actually, what Mrs. Zimmerman said to you, not that he had done MMA three times a week, or what he said was aerobics, right? That is what is written on the sheet, correct? Okay. But then yeah. I go ahead and go in more detail with the patient when they're back in the hmm. office. But when he talked about doing this type, we're talking about aerobic exercise, are we not? When I would ask him what type of aerobic exercise, then mixed martial arts would have been mentioned. Okay. And um, medically speaking, um, would you agree that whatever he did to stop the attack allowed him to survive it? It could have potentially, yeah. It depends on the amount of trauma he was sustaining at the time. So stopping the attack is what allowed him to survive it. Would you agree? 
It could have, yes. Okay, thank you. Nothing further. Any agree, agree, direct? Would you agree that's pure speculation on your part? I wasn't there at the time of the event, so I don't know the exact trauma that took okay. place. Thank you very much. Okay, may Ms. Fulgate be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you very much. You are excused. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to recess for the evening and for the weekend. So while we're in recess until Monday morning at 9 a.m., I want to advise you again that you're not to discuss the case amongst yourselves nor with anybody else. You're not to read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case. You're not to use any type of an electronic device to get on the Internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology. And finally, you're not to read or create any emails, text messages, Twitters, tweets, blogs, or social networking pages about the case. Do I have your assurance that you will abide by these instructions? Okay, with that, have a great weekend. Put your notepads face down and follow Deputy Jarvis. be seated. Is there anything that we need to take up before we recess till Monday morning at 9 a.m.? No, Your Honor. We, um, well. No, for um, Lisa, um, those exhibits that were numbers. Um, Mr. De La Ronda? No, I, I needed to make sure that exhibits 194, 195, and 197 will be handed to the clerk Monday morning. Excuse me. 194, 195, and 197 will be handed to the clerk Monday morning. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. 194, 195. Of course, it's 194, 195, and 196. Oh, not 196, yeah. I, I think we would through 197, I think. No? No. Thank you. Honor. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else the court needs to take up before we recess until Monday morning at 9 a.m.? No, no. The only very minor point is we're, we're getting a lot of progress done on the statements. If we hit a loggerhead, we might need court intervention for a couple minutes. We could probably delay that until just Monday morning at 9 o'clock. We'll give the alternatives and come back to you at 9, but that's the only thing. Well, do you want to say that we'll come back at 8.30 Monday morning and then you'll, if we don't, if you don't need court um, rulings on it, uh, you'll have an extra half hour to set up? Or if you, yes, okay. Uh, the jury's coming back at 9 a.m. We'll be back at 8.30 if, in case you need court yes, rulings. Sir. With that, court is in recess. Thank you.